What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another very exciting episode right here on the MI Gardener channel. We're here in the MI Gardener Seed Shop answering your questions. And one of those common questions is, what is the difference between seed varieties? When it comes to a shelling bean, a pole bean, a bush bean, indeterminate tomato or a determinate tomato, winter squash, summer squash, heading lettuce or leaf lettuce, what are the differences? What are the pros and cons? And that's what we're gonna talk about in today's episode. So buckle up, grab a drink. It's gonna be a longer episode because we got a lot to talk about and uh, hopefully you're gonna find this enjoyable. Let's go. All right, so the first seed variety we're gonna go through are beans. Now there are three different types of beans you can choose from. There are shelling beans, bush beans, and pole beans. Now, as the name does imply, there are some kind of inferences you can make as to, well, the pole bean probably grows up a pole, and that's correct. Pole beans will grow up a trellis. They need support. If you let them grow along the ground, they're going to end up being just a jumbled up, piled up mess, and you're really not going to grow them to their maximum potential. So you're going to want to give them some support. We have lots of videos on things like cattle panel trellises where we grew pole beans up those trellises. You can grow them up bamboo stakes or even you can grow them up like in a three sisters style garden. You can grow them up other plants. Things like sunflowers make great supports that allow you to grow the plants vertically. Uh, pole beans are also awesome because it gives you the ability to save on garden space. You're not growing along the ground, you're growing up in the air. So if you have a smaller garden, this is a great option for you. Now when it comes to the types of beans that are available, basically pick any bush bean and you also have a pole bean version. That's what's really nice, is if you like a snap bean, this, uh, you know, this Blue Lake pole bean is a go-to fan favorite. Everybody loves it really stringless, and it's basically the stringless version of what you'd get, which is the Blue Lake bush bean, right? Now, now there are other varieties of bush beans. What are bush beans? Well, as the name would imply, they are a bush. They just simply grow low to the ground. They give off several flushes of flowers. They differ, from a, they differ a little bit from pole beans in that pole beans, they need to get the plant fairly established, usually about three to four feet tall before the plant will start flowering. Bush beans, on the, other, on the other hand, will literally start flowering when the plant is like 10 inches tall, and after about 40 to 50 days, it'll start flowering. How it flowers is it puts out a big flush of flowers. Those flowers, once harvested, the beans you harvest, it'll put out a second flush of flowers. It, a bean, a bush bean, will typically put out roughly three to four flushes of flowers in a season before you need to replant. So they're a good alternative if you have lots of space and you like a lot of yield, because they will give you slightly more yield than pole beans. Now, the final variety of bean is a shelling bean. And as again, the name would imply, these are dry shelling beans. You need to grow them, dry them on the plant, and then pluck off the dry beans so you can shell them. These are commonly seen in things like soup mixes because they are hard beans. You're gonna need to boil them to soften them. Black beans, garbanzo beans, navy beans, pinto beans, uh, cannellini beans, lots of different types of beans, but those are typically, uh, well not typically, those are your dry shelling beans. And so if you are someone that wants to grow dry shelling beans, you wanna do that. Now, question I always get asked is, can I grow something like a Blue Lake bush bean and use it in a soup? The answer is yes, you definitely can. But what you'll notice is that these cultivars, the differences between them, they have their strengths and their strengths are kind of what they're most commonly used for. You can absolutely shell a bush bean, let the beans just dry in the plant, and then just shell the beans, throw them in a soup. You totally can. Is it the best bean you're ever gonna have? No, but you can still use that. So it's not like it's a hard and fast rule between the differences, but shelling beans are shelling for a reason. They give you a very uh, low starch uh, seed. One of the things you'll notice with some of the beans are the seeds are high, uh, they're highly starchy. So they're gonna have a more grainy, almost uh, mealy texture when they're softened in a soup. Whereas the soup beans, drying beans, they're gonna be a lot more soft and fluffy when they're actually boiled. So think like a black bean, really soft, versus like a blue lake bush bean, if you actually use that in a soup, it's not gonna have the best texture. So just keep that in mind, but that is the biggest differences between those. Um, oh, and one last thing on shelling beans. You can get shelling beans in both pole and bush, so just do your research, but they, that is kind of the big difference between beans.
Now we're going to talk about the differences between lettuce. So let us talk about that. We've got a, this is a heading lettuce and a leaf lettuce. What is the difference between the two? Well, if you're growing a cut and come again style lettuce, that is where you let the lettuce grow up, you trim the leaves, and then you basically just trim it down to about the top one to two inches of plant, let the plant regrow its leaves, you're gonna wanna be growing a leaf lettuce. The reason why is because you're gonna get way more yield by growing a leaf lettuce for growing it for leaves, rather than a head lettuce, which really uh, it kind of thrives being separated, right? You're gonna give it space, so it can grow out, form a head, and that head is, you know, it's, it's got its uses, it has its benefits, right? Iceberg lettuce, it gives you the nice crunch, that texture to a salad that a lot of people like. If you're growing something like a romaine and you wanna make like lettuce wraps, right, or something like that, you need a nice big leaf, you're going to wanna give those plants space. Those form heads. Heading, uh, heading lettuces need more space. They typically, you get less of them in a square footage because of that but also they're gonna have uses, they're gonna have applications that leaf lettuce doesn't necessarily have. The benefit to leaf lettuce is the fact that you can trim them and keep cutting them as long as that plant stays healthy, you're gonna to continue to get a yield. Whereas with heading lettuce, once you harvest it, you gotta replant. So you get more of a perpetual harvest with leaf lettuce than you do a heading lettuce. But also, you can actually use your space a little more efficiently because if you have a square foot, say one square foot, 12 inches by 12 inches, right? You can grow 50, you know, 25, 50 leaf lettuce plants, whereas you can get like two to three heading lettuce plants. So you're getting way more yield or you're way more plants in that same square footage when comparing. Now, the other final thing with kind of comparing types here is that leaf lettuce tends to get bitter slightly uh, slightly more fast, slightly faster I would say, right? Slightly faster than a heading lettuce. Heading lettuces typically are gonna be less bitter because they're just cultivated to be in the ground longer, whereas like your uh, black seeded Simpson lettuce or like this is a prize head leaf lettuce, they're gonna grow leaves very fast and the faster that plant grows, the faster it's gonna get bitter if you don't harvest it. So. You just gotta kinda know what you're going for. If you leave these in the ground for like three to four, uh, like like two to three months, I would say, these are gonna be really, really bitter. These are better harvested after like 35 to 40 days, whereas the heading lettuce, you're gonna leave it in the garden for like 45 to 50 days, never even touch it, let it do its thing, and you're gonna harvest it. So difference in flavor as well, as well as just how, how you grow it. All right, so now we're gonna talk about peas. And if you think that all peas are created equal, you'd be wrong. There's a huge difference between peas and a lot of people don't really understand the difference. So I'm gonna break it down hopefully in a way that you're gonna understand. When you are growing a snap pea, a snap pea is harvested for the immature pods themselves. The pod is this little green, basically skin that holds the seeds intact. It holds the seeds inside of the pod. You wanna harvest it and eat it before those seeds even form. That is a snap pea. They're usually pretty crisp and snappy. People throw them in things like stir fries or you might just eat them as a snack. For me, they never make it in the house because we eat them so fast. They're amazing, super sweet, really crisp, awesome. Whereas with a shelling pea, you're actually eating not the pod, but the seeds, the immature seeds of the pea plant. And these, you would not wanna eat the pods because you have to let the pods mature the pods are gonna to start to fill out. And when they fill out, what do they fill out with? The seeds. The seeds start to get larger. And so you'll notice in this example here, these little bumps, those are really, really, really immature seeds, but they're so immature that they're negligible. You don't even worry about it. And that's why you eat the pods themselves. Whereas these, see how much more large those are? Well, the reason why they're larger is because the seeds inside it filled out. But the downside is that you can't eat the pod because if you eat the pod, you'll probably choke on the string. <laughs> it gets really stringy and very fibrous because that shell starts to harden up and you're actually gonna be eating the seeds inside of that pod. So once that pod has matured, you basically crack it open, pop with your thumb those seeds, uh, those immature seeds out of the pod and that's what you're gonna be eating are the, uh, the peas inside. That's the biggest difference between the two. Now there are varieties that can be used as both shelling and snap. Do your research. We carry a couple of them over at migardener.com, but typically what will be disclosed is either shelling or snap. 
big difference between the two and you want to make sure you know that difference because even if you, so a lot of people ask this, can I eat a shelling pea as a snap pea? You can, but that string is going to get you though. It's a very stringy pod. It's going to have a bad texture. doesn't mean you can't. It just means you're probably going to regret that decision. Now, the other question is, can I eat, can I eat snap peas as shelling peas? And again, you can, but you probably shouldn't because you're not going to like the experience. If you let a snap pea mature and shell it, you're going to end up with a very starchy, almost like with the beans, you know, you're, you're going to end up with a very starchy, very kind of mealy bean or mealy pea in the end that you're not going to want to eat. All right, spinach. Now, at first glance, you might be thinking, what is the difference between spinach varieties? And in fact, there's a huge difference. Now, to the naked eye, spinach is spinach. It's not quite like bush beans and pole beans or snap beans and shelling peas uh, or snap, snap peas and shelling peas. Spinach is spinach. There's no difference in the plant that you're going to be growing. So you can go with any variety, but just know that the length of time that you have to grow it is important and how big the plant gets is also important. And that comes down to the variety. You have what's called a lobed leaf spinach or a spear leafed spinach. This is really important. And the only way you can know this is by looking at the leaf type. So lobe, lobe leafed spinach, as the name would imply, have very round lobed leaves. This is my favorite variety of all time. It is un unsurpassed as my favorite variety, and that is the American spinach. It's a lobed leaf spinach. It gives you a very tender baby spinach spinach. If you've ever gone off to the grocery store and bought a bag of like baby spinach, that baby spinach is almost inevitably a lobe leafed spinach. It gives you that really tender, super soft baby spinach flavor. These are harvested as baby spinach. You don't want to let these get really big because if you get them get really if you let them get really big, they'll be very fibrous and they will not be great to eat. The only way you'll be able to eat them is if you like saute them and wilt them down where it kind of breaks down those plant fibers. That's the only way that those become palatable again. So if you're harvesting for baby spinach, it is uh, unsurpassed as the best. You want to go with a lobe leaf spinach. Then there is the spear leaf spinach. The spear leaf spinach is going to grow much larger. It has much less stringiness in the leaves, but you're going to get a much bigger leaf. Now, the reason why people will grow the spear leaf spinach is because if you're going to be wilting down your spinach and sauteing it down or throwing it in something like a salad and you really don't care about the texture at all, you're going to get more yield from a spear shaped, uh, spear leaf spinach than you do a lobe leaf spinach. And that's simply because the leaves get bigger, the plants get bigger, and inevitably you're going to harvest more from it. But if you really care about texture and flavor, lobe leaf spinach all the way. So there are the two differences between the spinaches. Um, the differences between the spinaches. Uh, <laughs> and you're going to just, you're going to really have to just kind of decide how you want to grow and what you want to eat. All right, now this is the most popular one, and that is determinate versus indeterminate tomatoes. This is one that comes into our inbox, I would say, on a daily basis. And what is the difference? Well, very simple. As the name would imply, a determinate tomato is determined. Everything about it is determined. The plant height is determined. The fruit yield is determined. And how much fruit ripens all at once is determined. The rules for this plant were written in the form of a seed. It does not break the rules no matter what you want to do. If you prune it, if you fertilize it more, if you put it in a different location, it will always follow those rules. It is determined. And that's really great because it gives you predictability, which I love, especially if you're into like canning, right? Roma, great determinate tomato. It is determined, so everything is going to ripen all at once. The plant will stop growing. It'll focus on ripening those fruits, and you'll have a ton of fruit that you can turn into salsa or spaghetti sauce and stuff like that at the end of the season. It's amazing. The plant will stop producing and won't really die, but you might as well just pull it out when it's done. Whereas an indeterminate is the opposite. It just has no rules whatsoever. As long as the growing season will allow and you can keep the plant healthy, it'll continue to grow. That means 20, 30, 40 feet tall. As long as you can keep that plant trellised, keep it growing and keep it healthy, it'll continue to grow. So you can keep it growing, but also it'll continue to fruit as well. Now the only downside to this is the fruit doesn't really have a time in which it starts to ripen. It might ripen at day 50, might start to ripen at day 70, 
Heck, it might start to ripen at day 200. It really doesn't have a set time. So the, the ripening process is very sporadic and you're gonna find that it's, you, you need more plants to get the same yield all at once, right? If I'm growing five Roma tomatoes, I might have to grow like 15 or 20 of these Dr. Weichi's yellow tomatoes to get the same tomato count, right? The same fruit count. And that's just because the Dr. Weichi's is, is an indeterminate. It's gonna ripen sporadically, whereas the Roma, it's basically gonna hit that target height, it's gonna hit that target fruit yield, and it's gonna say, all right, everyone ripen all at once. So that is the big difference. Now, there's another little nuance difference, and that is the growing style. So you can grow both indeterminate and determinate in a uh, in like a raised bed or in ground, but in containers, that's where one shines far above the rest, and that is determinants. Determinants make great container tomatoes because of the fact that they're they grow to a minimal height. They don't you know they have that determined height, meaning they're not going to exceed that. They're not going to get top heavy. They're not going to fall over. They're very determined. And so if you're someone with small spaces. Growing a determinate tomato is recommended because it's gonna give you just that, that safety and security of knowing that you know that little container that you have it planted in, it's not gonna get super big and fall over and get all top heavy. Whereas it definitely would if you grew a, an indeterminate. So just some things to consider with your growing styles and what you're going for. All right, so now we're gonna talk about broccoli. Broccoli is, I think, one of the most misunderstood varieties of vegetables that exist out there. And that's simply because a lot of people just think broccoli is broccoli when in fact there is a very, very large difference between the two different types of broccoli that I'm holding in my hand. And that is one is called a sprouting broccoli and the other is a heading broccoli. Now heading broccoli is the broccoli that you see in the grocery stores. It's a nice big, uh, larger than a softball, but maybe slightly smaller than like a volleyball. I don't really know. Ball size has always confused me, but basically it's like a, it's a good size head of broccoli. Whereas with sprouting broccoli, you're not going to get any hat at all. It's just a small little florette, little bunches of florets that come from the side of the plant. And what this gives you the ability to do is to have multiple harvests throughout the season. You'll probably notice that when you harvest a heading broccoli, you might get a few side shoots, a few side florets, but you don't get nearly as much as you do from a sprouting broccoli. And so, in my opinion, I like to grow both different types of broccoli because I'll get a big yield of heading broccoli, and then throughout the season, I can come back and I can basically on a, basically on a weekly basis cut my sprouting broccoli. And so you're gonna be getting two different styles of broccoli. You're not gonna be getting a huge head all at once, but it's also nice because for me, I like to steam my broccoli, and I like little individual edible broccoli florets. And if you're like me, I don't like actually going with a full head of broccoli for fresh steaming because when you chop it off, you end up getting some spots that are like no stem at all, some it's just, and it just ends up with a big mess. With the sprouting broccoli, just cut each one off. It's almost like each little one you cut is little personal sized broccolis. And that's why I like that. So simple little thing, it's the small things in life, but it's definitely a really nice thing to, to know when you're growing because a lot of people will go with like a spring rapini, this is like a, like a broccoli rob or sprouting broccoli, and they'll say, well, I'm not getting any heads to my broccoli. Like, what am I doing wrong? I'm like, eh, looks actually really healthy. You're doing a great job. You just picked the wrong broccoli. Um, and then also uh, people will grow like a Calabrese broccoli, which is a heading broccoli. And they'll write in saying, I was looking for like the broccoli that you see in the grocery store where it's a really skinny stem. You wilt it down and it's like, you know, really tender, tiny little florets. It's not big heads. I'm like, oh, it's, again, it looks really healthy. You just have the wrong type of broccoli. So. Just knowing what you're looking for when you get your broccolis is important and knowing the differences is also important. All right, and the second to last vegetable variety that has differences that I wanted to explain were squashes. Now, I think we can all look at these two and basically tell the difference between them because winter squash is so vastly different than summer squash, but I still wanted to cover it because there's some nuanced differences that I think you guys will find enjoyable. With summer squash, the biggest thing that's different from a winter squash is the shelf life. If you're gonna be growing a winter squash, you can harvest that, take it indoors, and basically keep it on your shelf for like two to three months. Whereas with a summer squash, if you did that, you'd have a moldy mess within like two to three weeks. So basically, you wanna make sure that if you're growing a summer squash, you're gonna harvest it and eat it really quickly. Whereas with a winter squash, you have like two to three months to enjoy it. These are varieties like butternut squash, 
acorn squash, um, you know, like a candy roaster squash, things like that. Whereas zucchinis um, and like patty pan squashes are typically, those are your summer squashes. And so uh, that's the biggest difference is shelf life. Now, second biggest difference is the fact that with the, uh, with the winter squash, you're actually going to let the plant mature. You cannot harvest it when the plant is still alive and growing. You basically want to wait until that plant completely dies. Because what that does is it tells the plant to start hardening the skin, start forming sugars, and actually kind of, uh, kind of preparing that, that, that fruit, because that's what it is, it is a fruit. Um, it tells that fruit, okay, we're ready to form seeds, we're ready to harden that skin. Once that plant is dead, that is when the ripening process finishes. Whereas you eat zucchini or summer squash as the plant is growing. The more you harvest, the more you're gonna get. So the yield when comparing a winter squash and a summer squash is really, is really dictated by, again, the variety. You're going to get five, 10 times more fruits on a summer squash than you will a winter squash. And that's because once the plant produces the fruit that it needs, to essentially reproduce and be done, it's not gonna produce more. So the plant dies and whatever you get is what you get. If that's three, four, five fruits, that might be all you get on a winter squash. Whereas with a summer squash, as long as you keep that plant healthy, it's gonna continue producing. And so I've gotten 20, 30, even 40 fruits from a single plant before when it comes to a summer squash. So yield is another big difference, um, shelf life, Big difference. And then the final difference with these two squashes is how they grow. Now, in recent years, plant breeders have grown bush winter squash. You can grow things like a bush acorn squash, but I would say the vast majority, 80 to 85% of the winter squash varieties are going to be of the vining type. These are ones that you need 10, 15 feet to allow them to sprawl in different directions. Whereas with summer squash, Summer squash are typically, again, I think probably 90 to 95% of summer squashes are a bushing type. That means they're going to stay nice and compact. You can grow them in, in a container. You can keep them nice and contained. If you don't want them to go crazy and fight your other garden plants or you know, climb up the side of your house and take over your neighbor's fence, if you don't want them to take over like a whole city block, grow a summer squash. Big differences between the two and just how they grow. So there you go. All right, and the final vegetable that we're gonna talk about are cucumbers. Now, cucumbers do have variety as well. You can find a pickling cucumber, a slicing cucumber, and like a greenhouse or an English style cucumber. And so those are the three varieties of cucumbers, but how do they differ? Well, when it comes to a pickling cucumber, these are most commonly used as pickling cucumbers. They are usually pickled. And the reason why is because they're smaller. They're going to be about three to four inches when they get fully grown. They also have less thorns. So you want less thorns because thorns contain an enzyme that if they are pickled, that, that enzyme will actually kind of break down and soften the, the cucumber, making it less crunchy and snappy and a little more mushy. Also, the flower end contains the enzyme as well, and pickling cucumbers have been bred to basically have less of that enzyme. And so uh, plant breeders over the decades have grown, even though these are heirloom, have kind of grown cucumbers for specific needs. And these pickling cucumbers are no exception. They're bred specifically for making cucumbers, or making pickles. Now that being said, if you wanna eat these fresh, you totally can. There's nothing saying you can't, but as you'll find, the application for these are very specific, just like the application for like a slicing cucumber, like this Ashley cucumber, is very specific. These are gonna be longer, bigger fruits. They're typically sliced either lengthwise or in like little kind of uh, slices, right? Um, discs, and those are commonly used for fresh eating. They're gonna be way better eaten fresh than pickled. Now, you can pickle them, but you have some of the downsides of that enzyme that's gonna make them slightly soft. They're also much larger, so try finding a jar that's gonna like fit a giant pickle or a giant cucumber and uh, pickle them whole. It's really just not as common. And so you can, it's just not as common. Um, they're typically eaten fresh. Also, then you also get into the plant size. So the plant size for a slicing cucumber is much larger than a pickling cucumber, which is typically more bushy and, and small. And then the final one is a greenhouse or an English style cucumber. Now, the tender green cucumber, we grew this in our last year's garden, is incredibly smooth skin. 
almost no thorns, no kind of burrs on them. And um, you do not use these for pickling. I'm sure some people have probably tried it. It's not recommended under any circumstance. And so uh, these are used for fresh eating. They're used to be very aesthetic, very pretty, and they are awesome. Now, they are going to yield a much longer, very, very long cucumber. Something like 10 to 12 inches is like a tender green can easily get 10 to 12 inches long. So very, very long, very narrow, not quite as, as like uh, wide in circumference as a slicing cucumber. And also the seeds inside are going to be much smaller. That's why your uh, kind of your greenhouse cucumbers or your English style cucumbers are so much more expensive in the grocery store is because they are grown for a very specific purpose and that is fresh eating. And so you kind of, it's a very niche thing, but I'll tell you what, when you grow a really good English cucumber, oh man, nothing beats it. So uh, those are the three different types of cucumbers. Um, I hope you guys will try all of them because there's great uses for all of them. But uh, I hope you guys also learn something new about the other varieties of vegetables that we talked about. If you did, make sure to post down in the comments box below what you learned, if you learned something. Subscribe if you haven't already. And also, remember to go check out amigardener.com. You can check out all these varieties and so many more for just $2 a pack. We do free shipping on seed orders of $12 or more. And we ship internationally. So there you guys go. Hope you guys enjoyed. And uh, take care and grow bigger, go home. See ya. Bye.